All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Morris. Um, I'm the Snowflake, and this is my sales engineer, Vic Mahudra. So first off, I'd like to thank Jeff and uh, the rest of the team, uh, Tableau administration team, for having us in tonight um, and kind of sharing a little bit about our company, Snowflake. And um, so kind of, you know, I think we have about, what, 25, 30 minutes, Jeff? Yeah. So what we'll do is first kind of share how we're relevant to this Tableau community. Um, and then we'll go to a little bit about Snowflake, how we originated, how we help our customers from a data analytic perspective, and then take it a level deeper and, and kind of get into uh, what makes Snowflake unique. Um, and then close with some Q&A. And as Vic mentioned, if you ask, uh, a quality question, I'd say. Uh, any question. Oh, any any question. You, we'll, How's the weather? We'll give That's you some uh, stuff like uh, sticker swag. So. so real quick, how we're relevant to Tableau. Um, so Snowflake, as you can kind of see in this illustration, you know, I think a lot of uh, you in the room are probably you know data analysts uh, that are kind of consumers of analytics would that would that be accurate you know show of hands who's kind of consumer of data in here got it so snowflake where we fit in we're you know you really don't see us uh, we are a uh, ANSI SQL relational database we're really the engine behind all the analytics and the consumption they use on tableau Okay, so we are a very, very big partner of Tableau. As you can see, we have over 650 uh, joint customers. Uh, we're fortunate to have one of our local Cincinnati customers and Access Financial here tonight as well. Um, you can see some of our, you know, top customers here as well. It's, you know, one of the unique things is Tableau is actually a Snowflake customer. Um, so we're, we're very proud of that as well. Just so you know kind of how Snowflake fits into the broader ecosystem, as you can see here in blue is kind of where Snowflake fits in, right? So we have our data sources on the left. Um, one of the unique things that we'll get into that Snowflake is able to do is uh, ingest semi-structured data in its raw format and use simple SQL to query that data. So we are a replacement for you know big, uh, big data, data lake, Hadoop platforms as well. So our mission as a company is to enable every organization to be data-driven. And that's a very s uh, simple sentence to read, but it's actually hard to execute, as many of you know. Um, so whether it's a manufacturing company, a financial services company, healthcare, every company today is trying to figure out how to leverage their data assets to become more agile and nimble. And that's really... Uh, you know, how Snowflake sees the data analytics land space and where we try to help our customers. A little bit about our company. So as I mentioned, the first thing to really, uh, you know, wrap your head around with Snowflake is we are just a ANSI SQL relational database. However, we're very unique in the sense that we were purpose built for the public cloud. Okay. So, um, as you can see here, our founders actually, you know, two of them came from Oracle, one was from Cloudera, and one was from Teradata. And um, when they, you know, set about to, uh, actually the two from Oracle were the principal uh, founders who came up with the idea, and they were ac actually tasked by Oracle to go out and create a cloud version of Oracle Exadata. Okay, why they are still at Oracle. And what they found through months and months of research was the only fundamental way to do that and do it well was to start from scratch, to fully leverage the cloud and what it has to offer in terms of elasticity and scalability. So rather than do that for Oracle, they branched out on their own and started Snowflake in 2012. Um, so from 2012 to 15, we were in stealth mode, developing our product, getting feedback from the marketplace, and we launched our product in 2015 and you know, since that launch, general availability, we've had tremendous success in the market. Uh, as you can see, we've you know we've adopted nearly 2,000 customers in, in just over uh, three years, 
Uh, we've re received over uh, close to a billion dollars in venture capital funding. And we've been named a leader in, in most of the third party uh, quadrants, including Gardner and Forrester. Um, but you know, as we go through our presentation here, I think it's important to you know keep in mind as I, as I illustrated that first kind of diagram of how we fit in. Um, we're just an ANSI SQL database, right? Um, so a lot of the tools that you guys may use, like Tableau, we have native connectors for. So from an end user consumption perspective, you know, when you move to Snowflake, it's nothing really changes except the ability to receive your data and execute on your data. A lot, a lot quicker. So I'm gonna pass it to Vic. He's gonna kind of walk through some of the pain points that we, uh, you know, set out to solve for, and then how we do that. Questions? Nobody. Speak thing. Okay. Good. We got a question. Question? Yeah, sir. So that's a good question. How, he asked, how did the Snowflake name originate? So there's a couple of different reasons for it. Uh, first, uh, I think we have a lot of you know, uh, database people in the room, so you know, Snowflake schema is one. Uh, but the real reason is our founders are, are, are really big skiers. And actually, when they came up with the idea, they were at Lake Tahoe skiing, and um, they, you know, it was snowing outside, and they did, they just had this epiphany moment, basically, and, and they decided the name of Snowflake because you know snow originates in the cloud, and we're a cloud, uh, you know, data warehouse. So that's that's the real reason for it is they love to ski and snow and, and come from the cloud. Good question. So uh, quick, uh, so when we actually work with clients. We see a couple of core uh, problems in the current data warehouse. The first one we see is around cyber data. So what I mean by that is all of us work with some kind of a data warehouse. But think about all the unstructured data that we get from social media, from mobile. Now, traditionally, we put all the data in a data lake. And that kind of creates silos, right? Because you have your unstructured or semi-structured data sitting outside your structured data. And getting these two data sets together is a big problem. And while we're going to talk about that, we kind of solve the problem. Going back to his architecture slide, we actually bring these two ecosystems together. So this is one of the most important problems we see in, in the field today, silo data. I'm not talking about Excel, you know, data that's lying with your analyst. I'm talking about real huge data sets sitting totally separately in the, uh, in the cloud or on premise. The second thing you see around is the scale and the speed. So think about this. Today, it's not easy if you if you are working on any traditional application or a data warehouse or a database, you cannot scale it up or out on the fly. It's just not possible. The architecture was not built for that. So what do you do? You either go back to your vendor, uh, you rework your uh, numbers, and they reprovision, you know, extra hardware or software, and then you basically expand your cluster to meet your needs for the next year or for the upcoming, you know, Thanksgiving or whatever it is. But you cannot do it on the fly. So if your volume goes up or the complexity of the query goes up. You cannot scale up or out on the fly. Imagine if you have users coming to you and asking that I have these data science workloads, could be Spark, R, Python. Can you just on the fly provide them access to all that memory on the fly? You cannot do that. Can you do that in Oracle, Teradata, any database you think about? You cannot do that today. Third thing. When you provision your database today, you basically over provision it because you don't know what's going to come your way six months from now. So you basically provision extra capacity and kind of pray that you don't cross that threshold. Correct? Right? And the other important thing is that not just the hardware and the software, think about the number of hours your DBAs actually. Uh, work on the database to kind of keep it up and running. 
Think about all that indexing, vacuuming, partitioning, physically designing your database. All of these are actual tasks that happen on the data. And you have DBAs who are 100% focused only on doing that day after day. And that's a big problem, right? Third thing is all of these first three things, what do they what do they lead to? Basically, what it happens is that you don't have data that's available on the on time to make intelligent decision making or insight on data because all of these first three silos of uh, issues basically prevent you from running those queries you have to basically take decisions around who runs what query at what time what that means is that when you have your etl kind of workload happening you kind of block out your bi users because you don't want them to be hitting the database because you might actually trip the database you don't have that much of Imagine that if all of these four problems that you have, they kind of magically go away with a new architecture. And that's what Ryan will talk about next, is the architecture that we designed. So basically our database, the Snowflake database is basically built ground up on a totally different architecture that allows you to basically overcome these issues that you see in a traditional uh, information management environment. So, so he'll, he'll walk, walk through that, but we have a few other slides on the architecture as well. They are pretty deep. If you like, we can go deep into it. If you think, okay, this is this good enough for me for now, we'll be ready for Any questions? All right, we got a lot of stickers. <laughs> um, I have a question. Poll of hands. How many have in this room have experienced kind of waiting in line or being told to sit on the sidelines? Because another workload or another project is takes priority. Has anyone experienced that? Got one. Okay. See, yes, and you get a All right. Uh, and how many have experienced, you know, slow dashboards? Okay. A little more there. We got. All right. Yeah, you, you don't. We'll give you a sticker. She gets. She gets two because she just. So, yeah. So, um, no, thanks, Vic, for. So, you kind of understand, you know, the current challenges. I think some of you in the room are facing some of those that we illustrated, maybe not all. But I'm going to walk you through how Snowflake is very unique and how we go set about solving those challenges. So, first thing is, like I mentioned, we ingest structured and semi structured data, Parquet, ORC, JSON. You know, think about uh, you know IoT data, mobile data, clickstream data. We bring that data into Snowflake in its raw format, and we columnarize it as it comes in without any administration needed. And then that data is able to be queried with SQL alongside your structured data in one central repository. It's really a game changer when you talk about some of the next generation applications your business may be trying to analyze. Um, the second thing. And Vic and I will get into this in a moment. Given that our unique architecture, what we've done, what our founders have done, is from this um, entirely new code base, what they've done is fundamentally separated compute from storage. Okay? Um, what that allows businesses to do now is think about separating and isolating different workloads. Okay? So, Think about, you know, traditionally, if you're waiting in line as a Tableau user, it might be because there's another workload in the business that is taking priority. With Snowflake, you're able to isolate ETL, you're able to isolate data science from your Tableau uh, work group, and they're all accessing the same data at the same time. Okay? Um, additionally, um, you know, Maybe it's a Monday morning and you have uh, a, a numerous amount of Tableau users running their weekly reports or hitting their, their ad hoc analysis or dashboards or wherever the case may be. Um, given that traditional architectures, as Vic mentioned to, are defined by a finite amount of resources, the reason why you're, you're most likely seeing some lag or a slow dashboard is because all those queries are hitting in the box at the same time, and it can't so it can't really uh, support it from a compute perspective. Well, with Snowflake, you're able 
without any administration, Snowflake will auto detect when those queries begin to queue and scale out to as much compute resources as you need on the fly without any administration to offer that linear uh, performance regardless of how the users hit the system. We'll walk through that here in a moment. Um, the third pillar here, um, you know, as Vic alluded to, we work with a lot of clients that are, are, are um, you know, I don't want to name any names, but just traditional data warehouses that are very, very expensive, number one, to procure, maintain, and require a lot of hand-holding and administration uh, to, to keep them up and running from a business perspective. Snowflake is extremely attractive in terms of cost. We are a pay-for-what-you-use system. Um, so as much data, as much compute access as you utilize the system for is what you're built for. No more, no less. Um, and the last thing I think is very re uh, uh, relevant to this group is we are extremely, extremely fast in terms of performance. Um, given the way we've separated from co compute from storage, given the way we can offer instant elasticity in terms of scalability, um, we can support uh, any workload and do it typically a lot faster than what you've experienced in the past. Thinking like that. Any questions? Oh, we got one. I would say, you know, typically our engagement model is we, um, knowing that most customers, especially in Ohio, you know, are coming off some on-premise legacy solution, we recommend to try our solution out first before you make an investment. So we engage in a POC of Snowflake where you're actually moving your data into Snowflake. We can figure out a lot of these uh, potential issues or roadblocks in that, in that sort of engagement before you make an investment. So, yeah, that's where... Vic and I would engage with your, you and your team. So real quick, uh, and what we have about 10, 15 minutes, Jeff? Okay. Um, so this is what we call kind of the uh, money slide. If you understand this, you, you uh, understand how unique Snowflake is. So my hope is that this is a lot to look at up front, but let's break it down for it. So, as Vic alluded to, our founders uh, created a new architecture. That architecture is called the multi-clustered shared data architecture. It's separated into three distinct layers. The first layer is in the middle here, is our storage layer. The outer rings here are our compute. And kind of this third thing, third over, um, you know, illustration is our services layer. We are a software as a service, a data warehouse as a service, so there's a lot of services in Looking at the storage layer first, so we run on Microsoft Azure and um, Amazon AWS today. We'll be on Google GCP by the end of the year as well. Um, at which point, you'll be able to run Snowflake on all three major cloud uh, providers and also replicate data between clouds and between cloud regions. 
Um, all data is encrypted in flight and at rest. And as I alluded to earlier, you are charged uh, based upon how much uh, storage capacity you have in Snowflake per month. It's $23 per compressed terabyte per month. So very effective uh, when you talk about the cost of storage. Um, so looking at the compute layer, this is where it gets very interesting is, as I alluded to, Compute and storage are separated. So let's take this ETL workload, for example. Um, our compute clusters are sized based upon t-shirt sizes. So as you see here, extra small is one node within a compute cluster. You're able to scale that all the way up to a 4XL, which is 128 nodes within a compute cluster. This is only running when data is loaded. Okay, so if you load data for 10 minutes, you're going to be charged for 10 minutes of compute. And it's going to uh, auto detect when data quits loading and shut off. Um, so, looking at kind of the more Tableau side, um, as you can see, these workloads are all isolated from each other, so they're not consuming each other's resources. So, from a uh, BI perspective, say you have, you know, it's Monday morning, you have five Tableau users running some queries and you know, it's nine o'clock, you know, 50, 100 users begin to run some dashboards and tap well. This is our multi-clustering feature where Snowflake would auto detect when queries begin to queue on this original medium warehouse and it would spin up without you doing anything, another uh, virtual warehouse or compute cluster right alongside with it and load balance those queries across those uh, two, three, four, whatever, how many clusters you need to scale out to, it would auto balance those queries across those, offering that linear performance that we talked about earlier. As soon as those users maybe go to lunch or go to another business meeting, it would scale back down all the way until this compute cluster shuts off and uh, you're charged for the amount of compute that you're uh, used during that time. So that is the scale out. Remember, we talked about scale out and scale up. Scale out is usually for BI reporting. You need to allow concurrency. So you're basically scaling out to give you that concurrency. The one at the bottom over there is scale up. Those are your uh, uh, machine learning kind of workloads for R or Python or Spark, which are memory intensive because you're building those large tags to go through all those steps in the machine learning. So scale out doesn't help over there. It's not a competency problem. It's a problem where you require more memory or computing capacity. So then in that case, you can scale up the cluster. So I could start with a cluster that has got say two nodes in it. And on the fly, I can say, go up from medium into Excel. So, so think about this. It's a very simple concept. Sound very simple on a PowerPoint. But how difficult it would be to do this in a traditional database. They are all fixed size. You know, you cannot on the fly scale out or scale up. So I have Tableau uh, dashboards running in the morning, and I've got ten thousand users hitting the database. That thing over there, the scale out, can basically scale out from two nodes to forty nodes on the fly, and then scale back when it's not needed per second billing. That's pretty powerful. I use my cluster for 30 seconds, I get charged for 30 seconds. So that, that is the beauty of the architecture. And then the structured and semi-structured data we talked about earlier. You don't have to really define your structure for your JSON and Parquet and all the files. You suck the data as in and then define the schema on real data. Something that you do in a NoSQL database. But that database is separate from the relational database. So I'm now bringing both my traditional RDBMS and my NoSQL databases in one place. Pretty powerful. Then going back to the cloning feature. So we actually, so today when you actually have to uh, do your development, you actually stand up another box and then you copy your data, right? We have a feature called cloning where we can actually on the fly create a copy of production data without actually copying the data and give that as a sandbox to the users to do the development of QA. Same storage, but two different pointers at the storage layer, and that's called cloning. So you could, you know, in theory, take a like, 
clone a, a petabyte database instantaneously and not be charged for any storage. Snowpipe is a micro batching feature of it. I can actually stream data into a block storage or Amazon S3 storage, and I can continuously read the data as it comes in. This is called micro batching or real time or near real time type of application. The other things that we want to go detail in, into detail is sharing. So I can actually securely share a slice of my data, a database schema or a uh, table with an outside party without actually moving any data. So today when you have to share data with somebody outside, you either FTP that or you put it in a box, drop box or whatever mechanism to send it out. But I can with a few clicks expose a table to an outside third party and he can now come and run his queries from his graphical interface on that data. So no data was moved. I'm just exposing the data in a secure manner. That's called the data sharing capability. And this data protection and time travel is a pretty deep concept, but very simplistically, what it means is that any changes I make in my database, I basically have a snapshot of what it looked like. I store that. So what it means is that I can go back and look and see how my table looked a second back, two seconds back, 30 minutes back, 90 days back. To go back 90 days in time, time travel, to actually see how how the database or table looked at that point in time. So you make a, uh, you fire a query that basically goes and blows away half the data in your table. You can just roll back to the query ID that actually did the damage. <clears throat> so disaster recovery is being built into the database. And the fact that this is built on the cloud. This whole architecture is replicated across three AZs on Amazon and console. So what it means is that if for some reason one data center goes down, Snowflake is always up and running because two other data centers have all the information of this database. So you don't have to worry about ER. And this is all provided as a software as a service. So you don't have to manage the replication or anything like that. Which is why we kind of say that this is truly built for the cloud. This was not a lift and shift of Postgres hosted in the cloud. Remember, people always say we can host it in the cloud. We don't need to host it. We have built it for the cloud. And all of these features, cloning, data sharing, data protection, guess what? You're not paying for them. They're all free. The only thing you pay for is the per second billing for this compute and the $23 per terabyte of storage. It is such a game changer that people actually get shocked when they actually start using it because their hardware and software kind of investment drops precipitously. So Jeff has to go over some use cases. We'll go over Tableau one here in a moment. For the ETL side, one of our customers is Adobe and we Prior to Snowflake, they had an ETL workload that they would kick off every Friday around 4 or 5 p.m. And that workload would run for two and a half days and complete at 8 a.m. on Monday. With Snowflake, now what they do is they kick it off at the same time at 4 or 5 on Friday. They spin up on the fly 4,000 servers. They uh, load that data. It takes them four hours. So from two and a half days to four hours, they load all that data and then they shut those compute clusters down. Just to you know, provide you some context and, and one of the use cases. One of our top Tableau Snowflake uh, customers is actually Nike. And as you can see, they faced a lot of the same challenges most customers face, as we alluded to, data silos. They had a separate EDW and a Hadoop environment for their semi-structured data. A lot of concurrency and uh, performance challenges. They actually, when we engaged in a POC, they had a, um, a test, 99 test concurrency query test that they provided to every vendor that they engaged with. And if you couldn't pass what they already had in terms of performance, they would rule you out. We uh, not only passed the test, but we uh, increased the speed for this particular workload by 20% um, for replacing a traditional platform. 
Um, so they moved, actually they started by moving their traditional EDW to Snowflake. And now they're, they've moved both uh, EDW and Hadoop all in one platform with Snowflake. And they have about, I think, 6,000 concurrent Tableau users that hit uh, Snowflake on a daily basis. 6,000. Um, and then obviously we're here for the Tableau, but we do have kind of, you know, broad ecosystem, uh, native connectors to most of the tools you see uh, up here. We also have standard ODBC and JDBC connections as well. So anything else you'd like that? I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one, the financial services. I, I hear a lot of big banks, you know, that we work with that uh, all go to cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how did you see a shift in that from most of that financial services clients in the stack? Have you already got a sticker? <laughs> That's a good question. Now, uh, so no. PCI compliance. Yeah. So we that. so we have you know just we have SOC two, Type two, HIPAA, uh, PCI compliance, all the kind of certifications. Um, you know, I'd say two or three years ago, you're, you're, you're right. Um, actually, one of our founder, one of our founders was in town. He met with Goldman Sachs about three or four years ago. And was, when he was meeting with their executive team, they went through kind of similar message. Like, hey, this technology sounds really cool. When are you going to build it for on-premise? And given, as we mentioned, we are purpose-built for the cloud, so inherently we can't. Right. We're, we're, we're built for an infinite amount of resources. And he told them, you know, basically you'll you'll move to the cloud ever before we, you know, respectfully build an on-premise solution. Well, uh, fast forward three years, they're a you know, multi-million dollar customer Snowflake. So Goldman Sachs, Capital One, Sally Mae, Discover, some of the most uh, security conscious financial services in the world run their EDW and or Hadoop on Snowflake. So security, especially in Ohio, uh, we work with a lot of banks. Um, so it comes up quite often. And usually when we walk a client through some of our certifications, how we encrypt data and how we handle uh, those policies, uh, most companies are okay with that. The second question is by moving to the cloud, I mean, there are different options over there. I mean, some clients either have a direct connect with Amazon or to start with. Some, some don't. In those cases, uh, the 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 bottleneck we have seen is around probably around the EDL tools. Snowflake or any cloud data based as such works very good with ENP. So in most cases, we actually do recommend rewriting some of the uh, SQL or moving the SQL as is, but executing it after the ingestion happens on the database. So it's, it's, it's a journey. We usually don't uh, recommend lift and shift of the complete EDW. The first uh, uh, layer of the EDW that goes into the cloud is the reporting layer. And then it kind of gives the traction to build, uh, bring in the complete stack behind that. But there are customers who go all in. Because this is not this is actually cloud becoming a necessity now. If you do not do it now, you will be left behind. So there is actually a reverse mentality now. The customers we are working with, they are racing to the cloud. All they need is some hand holding with an architecture like Snowflake or something else, to kind of show them how to get there. But going to the cloud, yeah, they do want to go to the cloud. Two years back, yeah, there was some kind of hesitancy around that. But right now, their competitors are in the cloud, so they cannot afford to be on-premise and continue to pay $5 million for a box that's going to cost them probably one cent on Snowflake in the cloud. So it's all those kind of uh, decision-making that's becoming coming to play now. Or to be the 
Yeah, so you actually as a customer pick where your data resides. So in this area, you know, typically it's you know, uh, Azure Central or AWS East, right? So yes, you, you define where your data resides. Um, but as I alluded to, what you'll be able to do in a roadmap with Snowflake is run on AWS East, for example, and replicate your data to Google West. No, no other company, uh, right, can do that just inherently because they have their own cloud. So you'll be able to do that with Snowflake uh, in our roadmap. Any other questions? And that is more from global operations. You know, for example, a retailer may work with like their uh, processing happens in the U.S., but they want the reporting to be up and ready for Asia and Europe. So they want to actually replicate the end, end day reporting. Uh, Databases into Europe and Asia using Snowflake so that when they start the reporting, they're not interfering with whatever uh, operations are happening overnight in the US. Exactly. But there are certain areas that the data is restricted. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And you define that as a Snowflake user. Um, so yeah, I'd like to, I know we're, we're out of time, so I'd like to thank Jeff and everybody again for having us in. Um, you know, I am the first kind of sales director in Cincinnati for Snowflake, so we're very excited to get our name out there and, and share kind of the unique technology that we have and are able to help our customers with. Um, like I said, if you're interested, we do recommend um, always really is, is to test Snowflake out for yourself. and. Don't take Vicar Eye's word for it. You know, see if see if the uh, magic behind what we're saying is true. So, thanks again. And uh, if you didn't get a sticker and ask a question, feel free to come get one. Thanks. Thank you. And, and you don't require a credit card now to actually provision an account for yourself. So feel free to sign up. It's it's just a you filling up the form.